Well, that was uh, refreshing to the soul. Thank you so much for leading us in worship. I have a lot of things on my heart to say to you this morning, and uh, I ask the Holy Spirit to give me some help to filter as we go. When we have uh, been thinking about salt and light, I tend uh, to think like you do about individuals who uh, turn on the gospel light or shine as lights in the world, as the Apostle Paul talks about to the Philippians. We think about ourselves individually as salt, um, that we have some very privileged opportunities to affect the people around us by seasoning them with the divine influence and divine truth. And there is certainly an individual element to being salt and light. But the fact that we are salt and light is uh, more than an individual responsibility or an individual identification. The, the truth of the matter is that collectively we are salt and light. When our Lord said, you are the salt of the earth, He didn't use a singular pronoun. He was talking to us collectively. He was talking to His disciples. He was talking to those who follow Him. You as an individual and myself as an individual, we have a certain range. We have a certain scope. We have a certain footprint that we leave in the world with regard to gospel influence and godly influence. But collectively, the Lord is doing something very, very special and very important in the world through the redeemed church, collectively in the world. And I'm looking at the passage in Matthew 13. If you want to go back to it again, we were in there on Wednesday. And this speaks to the issue of our collective purpose in the world as the redeemed of God, as those who are lights in the world, as those who uh, bring the light to the corruption of the world, as those who bring the flavor, if you will, gospel flavor as we season the world. But it's more an issue of our collective impact than our individual impact. I, you don't want to get kind of stuck on that because there's a bigger picture to see in the purpose of God, and that's what uh, we're trying to understand from Matthew 13, 31 to 33. And if there's anything true about our Lord, uh, anything true about the divine genius r related to us in Scripture, it is that God can say a massive amount in uh, an economy of words. Uh, only, uh, I only wish that I had such an economy of words to say so much by saying so very little. Our Lord was the master at that. And in uh, these verses, verses 31 to 33, just three verses, there is a sweeping comprehension of what God is doing with His redeemed people in the world in this age between His first coming and His second coming. Let me read these three verses again. Matthew 13, 31 to 33, He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. He spoke another parable to them, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks, is how it's translated here, sata is the actual term, in, uh, who, who hid in three sata of flour until it was all leavened. If you know anything about a sata, you know that's about 16 pounds, three times 16, do the math, that's a lot of dough. And the idea of a little bit of leaven affecting such a massive amount of dough is to show how the smallness of the kingdom of God permeates the entire world. And that's the picture that I want you to look at in verse 33 this morning. But let me just review a little bit to set a context. Our Lord is talking about how His kingdom affects the world, how it affects society, and where it is headed. 
Now, the prophets tell us where the kingdom of God is head, headed. Back to Micah, the prophet Micah, chapter 4. Just listen to the opening verses of chapter 4. This is a prophecy of the coming kingdom of Christ on earth. It will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills. The next verse says, and the peoples will stream into it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he will judge between many peoples or many nations, as he says immediately after that, and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Though all the peoples walk each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in that day in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. This is a very um, parallel passage to the second chapter of Isaiah. And here the prophet is looking at the future, blessed, majestic, global, dominating kingdom of the Messiah. It will literally take over the world. Jerusalem will be the governmental center of the world. Jerusalem will be the spiritual center of the world. There will actually be, according to Ezekiel 41 to 48, a rebuilt temple to the one true God. People from all over the world will be under the power of the living Christ, the risen Christ, the ascended Christ, and the returned Christ who will reign on a throne in Jerusalem, as Revelation 20 says, for a thousand years in his kingdom. And it repeats a thousand years six times in that chapter, so there's no mistaking what it means. People from all over the world will come not only under his power, but will be irresistibly attracted to the king himself. Nations will be redeemed. The whole world will submit to the sovereignty of the King Christ. No force will be needed. Peace will rule the entire world. This is a glorious kingdom to come. This is where human history is headed. This is how it culminates. Another good look at what's coming is found in Zechariah chapter 8, and you can read these and study them in more detail on your own. I just want to set them in your mind. In Zechariah chapter 8, maybe verse 18 is a good place to start. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth months will become joy, gladness, and cheerful feasts for the house of Judah, so love truth and peace. Thus says the Lord of hosts, it will yet be that peoples or nations will come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one will go to another saying, let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will also go. So many peoples and mighty nations will come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from among the nations will grasp the garment of a Jew, saying, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. The whole world is going to be called to Jerusalem to fall before the king. What are those fasts that become feasts? Well, historically, when uh, Babylonian captivity came and Jerusalem was destroyed, the Jews set up fasts, fasts to commemorate so they wouldn't forget. If you've ever been to the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, you will walk out the door and they'll put a little pin on you with a Hebrew letter and it's to 
basically tell you to remember, remember, remember. The Jews have always done that. They want to remember the past because that's very, very important so that you don't relive it in the future. And so they established, because of the destruction of Jerusalem, they established some fasts. In the fifth month, they, they had a fast over the actual destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. In the seventh month, they had a fast over the murder of Gedaliah, who was an appointed governor there. In the fourth month, they had a fast because of the flight of the royal seed from Jerusalem. And in the tenth month, they celebrated the beginning of the siege that ended up in the destruction of that place. And they have remembered through all of history since then the horrors of the destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian assault, and they've remembered it by a series of fasts. But in the millennial kingdom to come, those fasts will be replaced by feasts and uh, the sorrow by joy. Still observed, they will be, but as feasts, not fasts. The whole world will come to a place of peace, tranquility, and salvation will come to Israel, and salvation will come to the world on a massive scale in the millennial kingdom. The whole world will be in the earthly kingdom and under the sovereign rule of the true king. That's wonderful. That's reality. That's exactly what Scripture says. But it didn't seem like that was where the program was arriving on the part of the disciples as Jesus went to the cross and even after the cross, after the resurrection, things didn't appear to be moving in any direction toward a takeover of the world. It wasn't going that way. It didn't appear that Jesus was going to return any time soon. I think originally they thought it would be soon. But obviously, it's 2,000 years, and he still hasn't come back. And so there are scoffers who say, you're waiting for your king to come back. That's what Peter tells us. Well, what a joke. Why would you wait for that? That's never going to happen. And it may have seemed that way to the apostles. So where is the kingdom is the question. Well, the answer to that question is very important. To help with that answer, John chapter 18 gives us the scene with our Lord before Pilate. And Pilate has this conversation with Jesus, starting in verse 28 of John 18. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves didn't enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore, Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? These are the Jewish authorities who had brought him to Pilate. They answered and said to him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, we're not permitted to put anyone to death to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. If the Jews had to put him to death, he would have been stoned, and he would not have fulfilled the prophecy that the Son of Man would be lifted up and die in the manner of crucifixion. So he had to die at the hands of the Romans. Therefore, Pilate, in verse 33, entered the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? And it's almost like a joke. Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? And there this answer comes. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But it is, as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Pilate said to him, so you're a king? Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, 
For this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him cynically, what is truth? What is truth? Jesus made no sense to him. How can you be a king without a kingdom? How can you be a king without a crown? How can a kingdom exist when it isn't made manifest, when it isn't a visible kingdom? This is folly. And yet Jesus said, I am a king, and I have a kingdom. My kingdom is just not in this time, space, dimension. Listen to the end of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. Paul says to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the proper time, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Reaching back to the very testimony of Jesus before Pilate, to whom he said, I am a king and I have a kingdom, it is just not of this world. Paul says, we as believers recognize that Jesus Christ is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he does have a kingdom. As I pointed out to you last time, in Luke chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is coming not with signs, not visible, not with people saying, look, here it is, look, there it is, but the kingdom of God is in your midst. Jesus was talking about an imperceptible kingdom that was a reality and was present, and the king was present, and the kingdom was present, and the king is still present, and the kingdom is still present even now. This is the mystery form of the kingdom which was hidden in the Old Testament and revealed in the New. There has always been a spiritual kingdom of God, God's rule over those who belong to Him by faith. And the kingdom of heaven exists in the world right now and the king rules and reigns over that kingdom. And its subjects are real. But as Romans 8 says, the world can't see it because it's hidden. Why? Because there has not been, I love this phrase, the glorious manifestation of the sons of God. When people look at us, they, they see us like everybody else, but they don't understand. We are new creations. We are heavenly creations. We have the life of God in us. We are eternal beings. We belong to heaven. We are indwelt by the Trinity. We are empowered by God. We're given an anointing from God so that we don't need human teachers to teach us spiritual truth because we have a teacher from God. And the teacher who is our teacher is also the author of the book, the Word of God. We have the book and we have the author as our personal teacher. The kingdom of God is real. It is just invisible. The disciples needed to understand this because their anticipation of the kingdom was that the kingdom was going to be external. By the way, just as a footnote, this is part of the conversation I had a couple of years ago with Ben Shapiro, who can't accept the fact that Jesus is the Messiah because he can't accept the fact that Jesus brought a kingdom he can't see. But that is this kingdom. Romans 14, Paul says, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, the kingdom has an impact on the world. In the parable of the mustard seed, we saw the external impact. 
from very small beginnings, it grows massively huge. And just to give you an idea of that, of the 7 billion people in the world today, or nearly 7 billion people, nearly 3 billion of them claim to be Christians of some kind. Christianity far outstrips any other religion. Even fast-growing Islam is maybe a billion and a half, almost half as many as claim to be Christians. This is the external explosion of the mustard seed. And as we saw last time, it has had an impact on the world in many, many external ways that bring about in the world the reality of common grace, what theologians call common grace, the, the good things that happen to everybody regardless of their salvation status. Christianity has been the cause of all that is humanly good in the world, from law and justice to compassion, medicine, hospitals, philanthropy, etc. So the, the kingdom has impacted the world externally, and that's the picture of the birds, other nations finding shelter and protection in the kingdom in its broadest mixed sense of wheat and tares together. So what is our Lord doing here? He's trying to help us understand the history we're living in. And so he's describing for us the kingdom. Do you remember back to Matthew 13, what I told you last time? The first two parables in Matthew 13 explain the nature of the kingdom. The nature of the kingdom. That will be, it'll be mixed. There will be uh, some people who will reject the, the seed that is planted. There will be some people who will be um, immediately responsive to it, but they won't last. They'll fade away. And then there will be that second parable, the wheat and the tares growing together, and we can't tell them apart. And we get that. We understand that. How many times, how many times, even in your young years, have you said, I'm not sure whether so-and-so is a Christian? That's exactly what Jesus said would be the nature of the kingdom. And so it is the wheat and the tares growing together until the final harvest, and only God can sort out the true from the false. So we expect some people to reject. We expect some people to accept superficially for a little while and then fade away. We expect a mixture to remain even until the end. So the nature of the kingdom now today is it is mixed. Don't be surprised that there are fraudulent Christians, that there are false teachers who name the name of Christ. Don't be surprised that false forms of Christianity which abound, and false Christians in true forms of Christianity. So that's the nature of the kingdom. And, but that's not, that's not what I want you to see in these parables. I want you to see that in spite of that mixed nature, I want you to understand the power of the kingdom. That takes us to those next two parables that I just read. And that's just getting you up to speed. The mustard seed, we get that. The kingdom will be small, it'll become large, and it will ultimately provide massive benefits for many nations, even globally. And that's why the birds lodge in the trees. And we saw the imagery borrowed from Daniel and Ezekiel. But now I want to talk to you about the leaven. We go inside now. This is internal influence. There's an external moral influence. There's an external virtuous influence. There's an external uh, benefit to life when you have law and order, justice, compassion, mercy, care, all those things that reflect Christianity. But more importantly, we have an internal influence. What do you mean by that? Well, that's the illustration of leaven. Look at it in verse 33. This is really a dramatic parable. Kingdom of heaven is like leaven 
which a woman took and hid in three sata of flour. Again, that is a massive amount of flour. Maybe way more than any woman would ever, ever bake. But it's exaggerated because the Lord is showing us the small influence of the kingdom on the whole world. What, what is this leaven? For some of you, just so you catch up with the baking reality here. Uh, our Lord had certainly seen his own mother baking bread. She would take a piece of dough from a previous loaf that had fermented. That would be called sourdough because it had fermented. And she would take new dough made from flour and insert the fermented dough into the new dough. And it's amazing that it would permeate that entire mass of dough. And when baked, it would cause the bread to swell, to bubble up, and to expand. That's what leaven did. A little bit of leaven, or if you will, yeast, a little bit can have a massive effect on a huge amount of dough. That's why the exaggerated amount of dough in the little parable. Uh, and by the way, if you give me a choice between a between a cracker and a piece of sourdough, I'll take the sourdough every time. Uh, that, that, is, that is the preferred kind of bread, obviously. Unleavened bread is hard, dry, flat, unappetizing, and you have to put something on it to digest it. So leaven transforms the dough. A very small amount of leaven permeates a massive amount of dough and changes its character, changes its character from something flat and dry and uninteresting and uh, to, to a degree tasteless and turns it into something completely different. It, there's, a, there's a metamorphosis that takes place. And notice back again at verse 33. She, she hid this leaven. She hid it. You, you don't see it. But it is influencing that bread, but you don't see it. And again, this is exactly what our Lord is communicating about his kingdom. You can't see it. You can't say, look, here it is. Look, there it is. You can't see it because it is, it is hidden. It is hidden. That, that's where we start with this story. But there are several things to recognize. Number one, the power of the hidden kingdom is great. The power of the hidden kingdom is great. It's great. The grain in the parable, or the flower, is the world. The flower is the world. And the entire world is altered by the permeation of the kingdom of heaven. What does this represent? The leaven represents just that, the good influence of Christ and his kingdom, his gospel and his people in the world. Frequently in the scriptures, Leaven refers to something evil. The leaven of the Pharisees was hypocrisy. But leaven is itself not a, a moral analogy. It's just a natural analogy. What basically permeated everything among the Pharisees was hypocrisy. Luke 12, 1, Jesus talks about the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And every, everything they do is basically permeated by hypocrisy. It's permeation that is the issue here. In um, 
Matthew 16, he says also the Pharisees are permeated by a lack of discernment. It permeates everything they do. An illustration, of, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is a great illustration of leaven as an influence, leaven that permeates. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And this will tie in specifically to our text. Verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a, man, that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Look, you've got somebody in your church that is leaven. Who is it? Go back to verse 1. There is immorality among you, an immorality of such a kind as doesn't exist even among the Gentiles. Someone has his father's wife. Whoa. Is this the Oedipus complex? Is this sexual relationship with your mother in the church? And you have become arrogant and have not mourned? So down in verse 6, he says, verse 5, you better deliver that person to Satan for the destruction of the flesh with the hope that his spirit may be saved. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Literally, that one person in your church living in sin permeates the church. Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or evil and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Here, leaven is sin, and it permeates a church, and that's why there's a call for discipline. What do we mean then by leaven? We mean a permeating influence. In the case of the Pharisees and in the case of Paul and the Corinthians, it was an evil permeation. But our Lord is using it of His kingdom in a positive way. When the children of Israel were told to leave Egypt, do you remember what kind of bread were they to eat? Unleavened bread. Unleavened bread. They were to eat unleavened bread for seven days. What, what, what was that about? The Lord was saying to them, you're not going to take out of this place anything from the bread of Egypt. This is a symbol that you don't bring any piece of Egypt with you. Remember what I told you how leaven works? You take something from the previous loaf, it ferments, it becomes yeast, you put it in the new loaf. Unleavened bread was God's way of saying to them, you don't bring anything of Egypt with you here into this promised land that I'm going to give to you. You leave it behind. For seven days, you leave it out of your diet. Leaven would indicate continuity between life in Egypt and life in Canaan. And God wanted a clean break, and that's exactly what Paul is referring to in 1 Corinthians where he says, leave the old leaven behind. Don't bring into your life in the kingdom anything from the past. Because if you do, it'll act like leaven. And what will that do? It'll permeate. So the Exodus features the fact that leaven is analogous to the permeating influence of Egypt. And you have to have unleavened bread as a symbol of leaving Egypt behind. Now, 
as we think of ourselves as leaven, we first of all understand that the church, small, has a massive permeating influence on the world. That's point one. The second point is this, that influence is from inside. Whereas in the mustard seed, it was external, now it goes internal. The dough has no power to change itself. The powerful influence has to be put, you don't put it beside it, you don't put it near it, you put the leaven inside it. It works from inside. It works from inside. In other words, we're in the world, but not what? Of the world. And the leaven of righteousness was planted in humanity in the incarnation. When Christ came into the world, He was leaven from heaven, planted in humanity. The peace of divine influence plunged into man's world. And that leaven is moving through humanity, all of redemptive history. And one day in the end, every knee will bow to the influence of that divine leaven. But we influence the world, true Christian people. Mixed Christianity influences externally. True Christianity influences internally. We permeate everything, everything. Everything we come into contact with, we permeate. At, at home, at school, at work, with your friends, in every part of society, in every part of culture, in every realm of human endeavor, from law enforcement to computer science and everything in between. We are the permeating influence. We shine the light. We pour the salt. So we are collectively a permeating, purifying force in the world. And again, much more collectively than individually, that's why I said what I did at the very beginning. And the influence is, is massive. It is massive. We have so much influence that the Apostle Paul, talking about ministry to the Corinthians, says, who is adequate for th these things? He's literally blown away at the influence he can have. He actually said, if you're a believer, you're a saver of life or you're a saver of death. Think about it. In other words, your very presence in, in the world adds to people's blessing or their curse from God. Nobody stays the same under your influence. You are life to life, meaning you compound the realities of eternal life by your influence, or you are death to death. You compound eternal punishment by your gospel influence. Because those who reject you and reject the gospel compound their own eternal punishment. Christianity is that influence. And we will continue to be that influence until a very important event happens called the rapture of the church. You say, well, how does that fit in? Listen, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says that the man of sin is going to come the Antichrist. Before he comes, there will be a falling away. And then the man of sin will come. Satan's archetypal, global, leading, lying Antichrist. 
described in more detail in Revelation. But before Antichrist comes, the restrainer is removed. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, 5, and 6. Something in the world is restraining evil. Something in the world is restraining evil. Obviously, it's us. It's the Holy Spirit through us. We restrain evil. And what you have in the eschatology of the Bible is you have the event of the rapture of the church. The church is taken out, and immediately all hell breaks loose once the restrainer is gone. We are salt and light, not in a we ought to be sense, but in the real sense We hold back evil from being everything the devil wants it to be. But when the rapture comes and we're snatched away and the rapture is an event with no judgment attached to it at all, when we're snatched out begins a period of time described from Revelation 6 to 19 called the Great Tribulation and hell belches out demons and all hell breaks loose all over the planet. War, death. A little microcosm of that. Defund the police and they burn the city down. There has to be restraint. And in the large sense, the church is the restrainer. And we will be until the Lord takes us out. And then, open your Bible today. Start reading in Revelation 6. Watch the war machine that's cranking up in chapter 5. Unleash hell on earth when Satan takes power. Do you understand this? What What was the primal sin Satan committed? In his fall, he wanted to be what? Like God. What did Eve want? She wanted to be like God. What has Satan always wanted? To be like God. He still wants to be like God. He's still trying to overthrow God. Temporarily, he's the God of this world, but he's managed by God himself. And God has put restraints on him, and those restraints are because of the external and influence and the internal influence of the church. And when that restraint is taken out, then all hell breaks loose and Satan thinks he's getting his final wish and he ascends to a level of sovereignty in the world the likes of which he's never seen until Christ comes back, defeats him, sets up his own kingdom and throws Satan and all his demons into the eternal lake of fire. And the kingdoms of this world then, Revelation 11, become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. So you have to understand this practically. Right now, we restrain evil in the world. And People who are the children of Satan don't like that. It's more than just some personal resentment that leads to persecution and hostility. The machinery of the world under the control of Satan operates in deadly earnest against the church. When the pandemic started and people shut down Basically, they shut down every church on the planet. How in the world could that ever happen? People say, well, that was incidental. They were trying to save grandma and that was a health order. No, it wasn't. The objective of the whole shutdown, the objective was to shut down the church. Why? Why did they care so much about it? Because that's where all morality, that's where all virtue flows from. And they want to be God, and we stand in their way. So they had to surface the 
the enemies. So they used masks to set people against the people who were unmasked, who, who believed in freedom, and then vaccines, and then it was an unvaccinated pandemic, and in a couple of weeks, it's going to be an under-vaccinated pandemic. And all they're trying to do is find out who rebels against their desire to be God. Have you noticed the people running it are high-tech people who think they are God and think they can create. They can't really create, but they can virtually create. They don't want you to live in God's world. They want you to live in their world. It's an alternative world. They're after the church. We're the people who stand against the slaughter of babies. We're the people who stand against homosexuality and transgenderism and in every other kind of sin. We're, we're, the, we're the people who tend to be the truth-tellers among the lies. And they have ways of identifying us, and it's really not about masks or vaccines or even a virus. It's about a takeover, and in the process of the takeover, you've got to identify the people who resist. We're the restraining influence in the world. And those who have been influenced by non-Christians, yes, but who are somehow connected to the moral truth of Scripture, they stand with us and they are a problem to Satan because they restrain him. So you're seeing a preview right now of the assault that's going to continue to escalate against those who resist. In the process, they take away all the freedoms. That's critical. Basically, they've wiped them out. The only freedom left, and it's their main attack now, is Second Amendment, because they don't want a group of people at the end still resisting and they're armed to the teeth. They're coming after the church because the church is the restrainer and Satan knows it. This is an incredible time to be alive. So when we talk about being salt and light in the world, we're talking about it on a massive level. On a massive level. We are that salt, we are that light. And we are the only hope for the, the world. It's not gonna get better, it's gonna get worse, but along the way, we want the Lord to use us to bring the gospel to people who need to hear and will hear and will believe, right? So we're not just an influence. Eventually, we have to go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel to every creature because how will they believe unless they hear? God has a remnant. We're here to restrain, and while we're restraining we're here to serve his purpose to redeem his chosen. This is the church in the world today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for your truth. We, we are just literally floored by the range of truth drawn from such simple analogies when basically seen in the light of the full revelation of Holy Scripture. Thank you that we're part of the restraint, that we resist the devil and he flees from us because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. May we shine as lights in this world. For your glory we pray. Amen.